It is such a delight to be with you for many, many, many reasons. And some of the greatest experiences that I have ever had have been here in Kenya. It has been probably, this is probably the 15th or 16th time I have lost count. And we ended the last service with the song, Through It All. And so when I first heard that song, I was in my 20s. I had just come to the Lord, or the Lord just found me uh, and brought me out of the miry clay. And when I sang it, I hadn't been through too much. But as I stand before you today, I can testify that I have been through some things. And there's a wonderful proverb for you young people uh, th that have not yet been through it. Let me encourage you that after you have gone through it, you will either be satisfied with how you've gone through it, or you will be dissatisfied. And if you respond to the Lord, you will not regret anything that he has required of you because he will do in your life exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. And we're going to speak today that there remains a rest to the people of God. And if you're one of the people of God, and I don't, I'm getting ahead of myself here, there is a rest that is supernatural. The kingdom of God is supernatural. The kingdom of God is within you. The righteousness, peace, and joy of the kingdom of God is supernatural. It's far, far, far above what you would ever attain on this earthly level. So as, as I stand here, I'm reminded of the proverb, the soul knows its own bitterness. And no one intermeddles with his joy. So there, is, there are things that belong to you that no one else knows. I don't know you, you don't know me. But if you have to go through what might be considered bitter things, if you go through it in the Lord, when you come out, you will have a joy that no one can take away from you. And it says of Jesus that he is anointed above all of his fellows or partakers. Moses is one of the fellows. Joseph is one of the fellows. Daniel, you know the list. But he is anointed with the, uh, with the oil of gladness above his fellows because there's a reason for it. And you will have the oil of joy for the same reason to the extent you do what Jesus did to get his joy. You are anointed with the oil of gladness above thy fellows because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And that is a daily choice. That is a moment-by-moment -moment choice where you will have to decide between choosing righteousness or choosing iniquity. But if you choose righteousness, you will be anointed with the oil of gladness in a way that you cannot conceive, and it will be in here. Everything that we have, and the only thing that we have, is what is in here. We have this treasure, as we heard in the previous message, in an earthen vessel. Forget about the earthen vessel. It's like having an old broken chest with gold and silver and diamonds inside. Nobody's going to pay attention to the, to the earthen vessel. They want the treasure that is inside. And so there is, there is an anointing <clears throat> that a preacher can have. <coughs> Excuse me. And <clears throat> one anointing can cause the place to erupt in people shouting with praises and dancing and the like, which is wonderful. But there is another anointing, and that is an anointing where the Spirit of God comes, and he so grabs a hold of your heart, 
and begins to reveal to you his glory in such a way that it begins to make you very still inside. The Lord is in his temple. Let all of the earth, thank you so much, let all of the earth keep silence. We have to come to a certain place in here in order to come into the knowledge of God. Be still and know that I am God. Now there remains a rest to the people of God. If you are a people of God, you can have the rest of God. You can have the peace of God that passes understanding, which means that your circumstances have nothing to do with your inward condition. And you may have come into this meeting today and feel you are in a storm. Or you may have come in and feel that the storm is in you. Have you ever had the storm going on in you? Well, live long enough and you certainly will. I want to turn to Lamentations just to begin this morning uh, with the prophet Jeremiah who had a storm going on in him. It's a wonderful place to come to because when you have a storm going on inside of you, you will learn that the Lord is the Lord of the storm. And he can speak to that storm in your heart and in an instant be still and it is still. Now, I'm going to preach to myself today and you can listen if you want. <laughs> because the things of which I'm speaking, although I have experienced them intermittently, they are not mine without interruption. You say, what do you mean? Well, David said this. Return unto thy rest. He was speaking to himself. Return unto your rest, O my soul, for God has dealt bountifully with you. Now, if David's soul had to return unto his rest... It means he was in unrest. Now, there's nobody here who has not experienced unrest, some to greater degrees than others. But the Lord wants to bring us to a place where we enter into rest and we abide in rest. And what that means is that you come to a place inside where you no longer labor to change people to meet your present heart condition, nor change your circumstances to meet your present heart condition. You become content in here. What a wonderful place to come to. So that whether you are abased or whether you are abounding, it doesn't make any difference because the Lord has done a work in you. And when I speak this morning... It is most important to remember that we're going to talk about five conditions of the heart that comprise this rest of God, this supernatural rest. And every one of those conditions must be created in you by God. You must be touched by the Spirit of God. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. And when that spirit, when the Holy Spirit touches you in here, and he births or gives you faith, you now have substance. You now have assurance. You can be as weak as weak can be. You can have utterly fainted and have fallen, and you're not getting up. You are exhausted. You're on the ground. And people come and say, what's wrong with you, brother? And you lay there and hardly can get the words out, I'm waiting upon God. Well, they that wait upon the Lord 
will exchange their strength for his strength. And again, as we heard in the previous meeting, he never slumbers, he never (laughs) sleeps, he never grows weary. And that's the strength that you will operate in whenever the Lord touches you in this way. And when he, it must be born of God in you. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Now remember that you're not, the world is not just flesh and blood. They are walking according to the spirit of this world, to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of disobedience that works in the world. So that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, we're wrestling against principalities and powers in people in heavenly places. And so we have to have supernatural power to overcome that in order to receive from the Lord what he wants to give to us. You are out there this morning, and your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard, neither are you carrying in your heart the things that the Lord has already prepared for you. They already have your name on it. They're waiting for you to come to the place where the Lord has so changed your heart that whenever he gives it to you, you are, you are without words except words of praise. And your heart is crying out, This is the Lord's doing, and now my eye sees, my ear hears, and I'm carrying in my heart that which when the Lord said to me, Now you do such and such. And I said to him, I will never. <laughs> I am unwilling. I'm not speaking just about me. I'm speaking about every human being. Because he works in us to will. So if he has to work in us to will, that means we're unwilling. And then he works more. Oh, he's what a worker. It is God that worketh in you. Don't give up on another person. And don't look at another person as the world looks at them as human resources. God doesn't have human resources. He has human beings. He has sons and daughters. He doesn't use people or for his benefit. He uses them for their benefit, for our benefit. What do you do with resources? That is a new world order term, an antichrist spirit term that reduces people to things, to be used up, to be consumed, and then to be cast away. That's, that's most relationships. So that five men were involved with the woman at the well, and she was to them human resource. But when Jesus came, he made her a human being. And he says, I know the number of the hairs on your head, and I know the thoughts I'm thinking towards you, and they are not to satisfy my carnal nature, Jesus would say. He says, my thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an end and to give you a hope that you have never had before. We are being confronted in the world by the power of the Antichrist spirit in a way like never before. If the Lord doesn't step in and stop it, we are going to have to go through things, especially the church, where we're going to have to have in our heart the attitude, our God is able to deliver us. But if he chooses not to, by his grace, we will not bow down to your gods. Let there be in us the spirit that was in the disciples when after they were beaten, they went back rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. When you have that in your heart, in your human vessel, you have a treasure. So here is this man, Jeremiah, wonderful man of God. He, he would come to the Lord 
He's so faithful in difficult circumstances. And he came to the Lord one day, and you've probably asked the Lord this same question. Why do the wicked prosper? Why are earthly conditions the way they are? Do you know what the Lord did? He totally ignored the question. And he went right to the heart condition of Jeremiah. There are things you want to know. The Lord's not concerned about you knowing them. What the Lord is concerned about is your heart. And that's why he said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you have run with the footmen, and they have wearied you, they have exhausted your strength in here, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? Well, that's a good question, Lord. I think I better consider the ramifications of it. In other words, the Lord is stealing right in here. Have you ever had the experience of being in utter weakness and in a moment's time be taken into utter strength, unlimited strength? It happened to me many, many years ago. I think it was 1995 or six in Nakuru. I testified of it here one time. I was in my heart writing the letter of resignation as the pastor of the church. I was supposed to get up and stand before the people and preach. I had nothing. I was as empty as empty could be. I could maybe preach from here up, but that's not good. It has to come out of the innermost being, out of our belly, rivers of living water. And so I'm standing there and I'm thinking, Oh, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get up there, but I'll probably say hello and goodbye, and that would be it. And in a moment's time, being in those steps, and the Lord has to take us there. Understand this. He has to take us to the end of ourselves. It's not a pleasant journey. In fact, it can be very distasteful. But the deeper He takes you, and that the more he weakens you, the greater the experience you will have in him when he transforms you, even in a moment's time. But it's not in a moment's time. It takes a long time. Not, it, it takes waiting upon the Lord. So he, have, he may have you wait for a week, a month, Three months, ten years, Moses, forty years. And it seems like all of a sudden God shows up. He was there the whole time. He was bringing you to a place in your heart where you could now receive what he could not give you when you walked in your own strength and in your own knowledge and the like. His ways, they are not our ways, neither are his thoughts our thoughts. They are as high as the heavens. So lay aside your understanding and put in its place a trust in God. You may not have the faith at this time, but there's one thing that you can have because you've been born of the Spirit of God, and this, is, this you must have if you are going to have the rest of God. Born of the Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hope is a most powerful thing. Hope will be in you in the depths of your being and you may not even be aware that it is there. But because you have hope, it can bring you to a place of stillness inside and rest. And that ties together with the second element or heart condition. And that hope is this, uh, uh, that, that's in this hope. When Paul says, we know that God works all things together to put his goodness into us, if we are called according to his purpose. For he has predestinated us. What You say, what do you mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory? He has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. You have been called, you have been born again, to be changed from one glory to another glory to another glory, even into that same image 
that your spiritual eyes are beholding. We, are, we behold the glory of the Lord in a glass. And we're beholding his glory. And John beheld his glory. And he said, we saw his glory. Well, what is it, John? He is full of grace and truth. So that when God changes you or changes me from one glory to another glory, he's filling us more with his grace and with his truth. And he will move us to in our hearts where the grace not only that has come towards us and into us, but it goes out from us. And people are amazed at by our response in natural circumstances that would have caused them to curse. And because we are full of grace and truth, we bless. Glory to God. The Holy Ghost will set your feet to dancing, won't he? Oh my God. I wish I knew 50 years ago what I knew today. You have to have some experiences in God to where you look back and you said, this, this has to be the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. I was a very young man and I suffered the loss of of the greatest affection of my heart. I said, this has to be, nothing, nothing could be worse in my life than what has happened. And then I got saved. And I had this hole in my heart filled with pain. And I went on, year, month after month, year after year, 10 years, asking the Lord to take it away. Do you know, it took, I think, about 13 or 14 years. And he waited and then one day, instantly, instantly, healed me. And I think, well, why did he wait so long? Because he was doing a work in me that nothing else could do. Do you know that just recently, maybe two or three years ago, I said to the Lord, Lord, that, was, that loss was one of the greatest things that could have ever happened to me because of how you used it to do your work in me. He works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure, but that's not the end. Folks, he wants to bring us to the place where in our heart we're crying out, I delight to do thy will, O oh God. Why? Because we have become a partaker of the divine nature. So here is this man, Jeremiah. And he is in a place of great unrest because of his outward circumstances. This, I, I even hate to use the term, I don't even want to mention it, but I have to, this virus thing that's going on has caused people to become oppressed, fearful. And remember that fear is not of the Lord. And his love can, if you're fearful here this morning, his love can cast that fear out. He doesn't want to, his children living in torment. So seek the Lord and do not seek man's solutions. Seek the Lord for him to do in your heart in one instant what man and all of the, his silly stuff cannot do. So i got to watch my attitude in that. I'm, forgive me for that. <laughs> anyway. Jeremiah says, the Lord has led me into to darkness and not into light. Why would he do that? He said, the Lord, he's been like a bear and a lion to me. He said, the people, they have made me their song. He said, the, what I've gone through has brought me to such an end of myself, to such weakness, to the place where he says in verse, um, oh, I'm in Job, that's not going to Lamentations, where he says this in verse 18. No, let's go back to verse 17. And thou hast removed my soul far from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, he said to himself, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Have you ever been there? My strength and my hope 
is perished from the Lord. But if Christ be in you, no matter what, how bad you feel, at some point, at some time, in your trial and difficulties, out from you will come. I know my Redeemer liveth, and when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. That's not just in Job. That's in every believer. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you get into something, and you say, I don't know how. I don't know when. But somehow, sometime, you're going to work this negative circumstance to put your goodness into me, and I'm going to wait upon you. I'm going to enter rest. I'm going to become still inside and know that you are God. I will know it by personal experience. The Lord wants each of you, by personal experience, to know his touch, to know his salvation, to know his deliverance, to know that what he did, you say in your heart, only the Lord could have done this. And it doesn't matter whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you're male, whether you're female, your earthly circumstances do not limit the Lord. He is able to do exceeding abundantly. He is able to work all things together to put his goodness into us. Now, here is Jeremiah, and I, I have to rush through this to get the five in, but He's in this condition, and we don't know how long. But after a period of time, he says this. This I recall to mind. Now, if David had to return to his rest, he had lost his rest. If Jeremiah had to recall something to his mind, he had forgotten what he once knew or once lived by. That can happen to us. And so he said, this I recall to mind. What is it, Jeremiah? He said, the mercies of God. The goodness of God. I would love to hear you sing, maybe even after the service, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been oh so good. I will sing of the goodness of God. He says, I remember it. I'm forgetting about the gall and the bitterness. I'm remembering the goodness of God. He says, and whatever my situation is today, I know this. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So that if you're in a difficulty today, if the storm is in you today, I testify to you by personal experience that the Lord can come in the morning, and in his new mercies, he says to you, peace, be still. And you enter in to perfect peace. Circumstances haven't changed. What has changed is you want it in here. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Why? Because it was born of the Spirit of God. We might be as wishy-washy as can be. But when the Spirit of God births something in our heart, He puts a resolve in us that all hell cannot defeat. And it is born of God, and it overcomes the world in our earthly circumstances. Oh, what potential. I, I see you young people out here today, and there is waiting for you. Oh, if you only trust Him. Just like... The Father said in, in Proverbs, Son, lean not to your own understanding. Do not, do not listen to the voices of the world. Do not listen to the voices of science and man's knowledge. It, it's darkness. It's death. Listen to the voice of the Spirit of God, for His words are spirit and life, and they are sharper, and they will... They will divide your heart and separate your heart unto him. And that's what you want. And when you come through, you will not only have a song on your lips, but it will be written upon your 
heart, through it all, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus. I learned to trust in God. <clears throat> the next thing is that you have to, and again, only the Lord can give you the strength to do this. And I'm going to, I'm going to just briefly touch on this. You have to be able to cast all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. That takes some time to learn. Uh, and I'll just leave you <coughs> in the Lord's hands with that. And I want to get to the fourth one. But before I do, I have to go back to Jeremiah. In verse 24, in Lamentations, this is something that's taking place in his heart. And the Lord has created in him this attitude, the Lord is my portion. In other words, no one else and nothing else is going to satisfy me but the Lord himself. Did he not say to Abraham, I am thy great and exceeding reward? Where you will not be satisfied with anything less than the Lord himself. What you are doing is you are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And when you have this attitude, then what you do, as Jeremiah did, he says, therefore will my soul both hope and quietly wait for the Lord. What a wonderful place to come to. Why? Because as long as you're waiting, you're coming closer and closer and closer and closer to where your eye see and your ear hears and you shout in your heart, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in my eyes. And you have come to an experience in God and all of the bitterness is behind you and now all that you have is the joy of the Lord. And the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Now the fourth one, and this one will be hard for you to swallow. And you may reject it out of hand, that's all right. Because I know that the word of God is not bound. All I have to do is speak it. And when you hear it, you're hooked. You're done. <laughs> because he'll bring it back to you again and again and again. It will be just like the word of Stephen that pricked the heart of Saul of Tarsus. And after a while, even though you may not be willing, he'll bring you to a place where you say, yes, Lord, that's what I should do. And this is the fourth thing. You cannot have the rest of God unless in your heart, not necessarily out there, but in your heart, you suffer the loss of all earthly affections. In other words, you lose your life in your heart. Because as long as you're holding on to anything or anyone, the threat of that loss will disturb your rest. So when Paul said, I have suffered the loss of all things, it put in him a rest that nothing else could. Now, if you're not there, and, and there's times when I want to grab a hold of saving my life in some way, such as my wife, but, or my children, my grandchildren, whatever. But you have to give it to the Lord. Because he's the only one who can keep it anyway. And if you strive, if you're 15 years old, and you're, if you save your life, every day for the next 70 years, you're going to learn what Jesus said when he said, he that seeks to save his life will lose it. And you'll stand there at 75 years of age or 80 years of age with a history of saving your life and you'll lose it all in one day. And death will come and say, it will be mine, it's mine. But oh, if you trust him and you'll lose you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to lose my life for your sake. And you trust him. You trust him. 
you come to the place where you, I didn't lose anything. All I did was gain. It took a while for the Lord uh, to work on me, to make me willing to go to Bible school. I had no intention of being a preacher. But he was working on me, and he would not let me get away, and finally I did. And I had to sell a beautiful house in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Quit my job. Take four children and go to Bible school. There were times I walked day after day with not a dollar in my pocket. I'm not exaggerating. The Lord was sustaining me. He does a good work when he sustains. Gave up that house. Do you know I have so many houses today, I can't even count them. They're in Poland. They're in Romania. They're in Bulgaria. And I don't have to pay the mortgage on them. I don't have to pay the taxes. They're mine. But above it all, relationships with, of course, the Lord and with the people of God. Well, I'm going to have to close here. The fifth one. You have to quit sinning. Because there is no rest to a person who is sinning. You say, how in the world could I ever do that? And Peter tells you, he, well, first he says this, arm yourself with the mind of Christ. For he, and this was the Lord's mind while he was on earth, arm yourself with the mind of Christ. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And I'm not talking about going out and getting drunk or sexual immorality. It causes you to follow the Lord. You follow in his steps. And the way that the Lord will bring you to this place. There's a scripture in Corinthians where Paul says, God calls those things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. His work is to bring to nothing our flesh, our carnal nature. It's pride. It's uh, bitterness. It's anger. All of these things. And so he will bring you to places He will lead you to certain places where he then says to you, I want you to build me an altar. And this is what I want you to put upon that altar, whatever it might be. And he brought Abraham into the land and he appeared to Abraham. And at that place, it doesn't show it in the scriptures, but he said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to put this part of your life on the altar. And it says, And Abraham built an altar to the Lord. And every time that you obey the Lord and give to him what he is asking for from you, and you build that altar, you will find God to be a consuming fire. And he will come down upon that sacrifice And he will consume it. He will bring it to nothing. I remember one time whenever he required something of me in Bible school. And when he first said it to me, I said, I will never, ever. And I was saved. I was singing praises to him and praying and reading the Bible. But I said in my heart, I will never, ever, ever do that. But Acts tells us he gives the spirit to those who obey him. And it took him three or four days. And my flesh was being tribulated. You know, I was rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. But now, until I could come to the place where I was going to do what God told me to do, I was miserable. I had no rest in my soul. And he kept at me and he kept at me. And I came to the place where he strengthened my hands that I was able to build an altar. Not me, but the the strength of the everlasting God. The excellency of the power was of God and not of me in building that altar. And I built the altar and I put it upon it. And the Lord came down 
And he consumed. Oh, he consumed what was worthy of being consumed. Do you get that? There's things in us that are worthy of being consumed that when they are, all we will shout is hallelujah and thank the Lord for doing it. And he reduces it. A consuming fire reduces what it burns up to ashes. And this is his promise. He gives beauty for ashes. We will not progress in the Lord unless we build altars. And we will not come in to the rest of, uh, or into the promises of God unless we enter into his rest. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. And while they are resting, God is working. And God is doing what only God can do. And you say, I'm not making any progress. Whew. Moses, for 40 years, says, I'm not making any progress. And the Lord says, you can't imagine. Because the work I'm doing in you is a work where you will have with me the heart to have a face-to-face -face relationship like no other man. My beloved brethren, oh, you're precious. Far more to the Lord than to me. <laughs> and his thoughts towards you, his desires, what, what he values you at, is his own life. His last drop of blood. You are as valuable as Moses or whoever you want to put in there. Because Jesus paid the same price for every one of us. And so I don't know if I will have the opportunity. I certainly hope so. Uh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> but to come back and be with you and to share the goodness of God if you don't understand the things that I've said, don't be concerned, especially if you're young. You have to live a little bit. I don't know, didn't know any of these things when I first came to the Lord. Wait maybe six months. If this is recorded, listen to it again. Wait a year. Wait ten years while the Lord works in you. And when he does, you will come back and you will hear this message totally different than what you're hearing it today. Obey the Lord. Walk in what he wants you to do. Be faithful. Be in submission to uh, the leaders of the church as unto the Lord. And when those doors are open, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, for this is the place of life. I am come that you might have life. This is, this is where the life is. Not in your home locked up like in America where they lock, up, lock people up in their homes and the people sit and feed on death all day long. The news, movies, and the like. You come here and hear the word of God. You sit before the Lord and hear the word of the Lord. Give yourself to him. While the world is rushing to destruction, you be still and wait upon the Lord and he will rush you to life and that more abundantly. Amen. Lord bless you.